we need to discuss the elephant in the room. It's pretty weird that I'm wearing minister robes to a TED Talk. It would be much weirder if any of you were doing this, but still. I'm wearing my robes tonight to invite us to question some of the preconceptions we may have had when entering into this space tonight. Because the role of a minister is to comfort the afflicted and afflict the comfortable. <laughs> And so my role here tonight is to ask you some questions that are probably going to make you uncomfortable. I'm sorry in advance, but also sorry, not sorry. <laughs> so I'm going to begin with a question. If you could use artificial intelligence to talk to a loved one who has passed away, would you? Now, it's a tough question, right? Because we hold these things separate religion and technology, God and science, death and artificial intelligence. And the idea of AI at our funerals or in our hospices or even in our grief support groups, it feels like some sort of anomaly. Like these parts of our lives that should never really cross. But it's intriguing, right? Like what if? What if there was a chat GPT that could encode your memory into immortality? Or what if there was a generative AI that could tell you the truth about the afterlife? Or even, what if there was an automaton that could make it feel like your grandmother was alive again? Now, some of these ideas might make us a little bit uncomfortable, but let's hold off on that for a second. Because what if? What if AI and death are not an anomaly? What if AI is just the newest human tool that we all have of making sense of death in our lives? We are living in the third wave of artificial intelligence, the era of deep learning and large language models. And it turns out we are living in the era of AI and death. It's a time where we can build these chatbots and holograms using the data of our dead loved ones so that it can feel like we are speaking to them from beyond the grave. We call these chatbots grief bots, and they are not some distant Black Mirror episode. They are here now, and they are changing the way that we as a society interact with death. But are they changing it for the better or for the worse? Well, we'll get back to that important question in a second, but first I want to tell you a bit about myself and what the heck I'm doing here, talking to you about AI wearing this. And I want to begin when I was 20, and I was about to graduate college, and I was trying to figure out what the heck to do with myself. And I had a philosophy professor, and he gave me the advice. He said, Dylan, go do the thing that scares you most. He said, go do the thing that keeps you up at night. And about that time, we were doing our unit on Nietzsche, the philosopher, and his famous quote about the abyss. Some of you might know it. And the more you stare into an abyss, the more it stares back into you. And as a philosophy bro at the time, and guilty as charged still right now, a little bit, <laughs> I loved this quote. And so I decided when I graduated, I was going to make a career out of the abyss. I was going to make my living out of death. I went on to get my Master's of Divinity degree, which sounds like a Harry Potter thing, but it's real. It's a real degree, I promise. <laughs> and I became a minister and a hospital chaplain. For those of you who don't know, a chaplain is someone who goes room to room in the hospital helping patients and families make spiritual meaning out of whatever it is they might be going through, but especially times of death and grief. And I will never forget the first time as a chaplain where I watched someone take their last breath. It was about 2 a.m. 
It was one of my overnight shifts, and I got the call on my pager. We were still using pagers in those days. And I rush up to the seventh floor ICU of this massive hospital deep in Harlem. And when I enter the unit, I see this 30-plus person family, this big Baptist family, pouring out of this small room. And the patient's mother, she calls out to me and she says, Chaplain, Chaplain, come here. I need you to pray right now. And I'm still groggy, but oh my God, I pray my heart out. And just as I am getting to the second syllable of the word, amen, the patient, the mother's son, he takes his last breath. And I will never forget the feeling of that room in that moment. Now, since then, I've been with hundreds of people as they have taken their last breath, and the thing I can tell you that I have never gotten used to is the look of someone's open mouth that is no longer taking in or exhaling air. In my head, I took to calling it the abyss because it stared back and it scared me. And to my patients that were now swallowed by this abyss, I always wanted to ask them the same three questions. Where did you go? What do you see now? And what have you come? When I was 27, I got the call about my own father from a morgue down in Tallahassee, Florida. So I went down to identify his body, and in the morgue, his body was a lot like mine. It was a little older, fatter, but he had the same patchy mustache. And in that morgue, I wondered, did I want to ask him the same three questions that I wanted to ask my patients? Where did you go? What do you see? What have you become? And with those questions still on my tongue, when I was 30, about five years ago, but who's counting, I decided that I would leave the active ministry, at least to the degree you ever really leave the ministry. It's sort of like the Army Reserve. You're always in the wings, just in case. But I made a career shift, and I came to academia, first to religious studies, where I researched AI ethics, and then here to CU Boulder, where I transferred to the information science program, where I'm about to graduate, and here I research death and technology, including AI. And what I can tell you is that AI really is changing the way that we interact with death. You have companies that are coming out of the woodwork promising that they have grief bot technology that can allow us to answer those questions that I so desperately wanted to ask of my patients and my father. They say they have generative AI tech that can allow us to speak to our dead. I'm not going to get too technical in this talk, but what's important to know is that while old AI models are really good at regurgitating information, newer AI models, generative AI, are really good at connecting that information and appearing as if they're creating new information. But I've kept you waiting long enough. How do grief bots do this? I want you to imagine. Imagine that you are at a funeral, and you're sitting there in silent reflection, and all of a sudden, on the back screen in the auditorium, a woman's face appears. And it's the face of a woman named Marina. And her hologram, she starts talking to you, and she starts asking you how you're doing today. And you answer her, and then you ask her a question back. And she responds as if she is still there. And this is real. This is an example of story file AI, a technology that was developed by Marina's son that allowed her to speak at her own funeral. Or you can take the example of Hereafter AI, which was a technology developed by a man named James. 
James had learned that his father was dying. And so what James decided to do was record his father's memories, his laughter, his jokes, and James built what he called DadBot, <laughs> which was this bot, this AI-powered replica of his dad that didn't just tell or replay old stories, it created new stories. It cracked new jokes. And this isn't just a Western phenomenon either. Some of you may have seen the docu-series Meeting You, in which a South Korean mother, she uses a VR headset in order to reunite with her seven-year-old daughter who had recently died. And using that VR headset, she was able to hear her daughter laugh one more time, see her smile, and reach out her hands for one last goodbye. So at least a little bit, we do have the technology that allows us to talk to at least a version of our dead loved ones. But then the question comes, and some of you might be having this question right now, but just because we can, should we? I'm honestly not sure if I would use this technology, say, to talk to my dead father. But what I am sure about is that this conversation that we're having about AI and death, it was never about the AI. It's about what we do with the new tools we have to interact and make peace with that open-mouthed abyss. As an AI ethicist, I'm actually kind of excited and hopeful that we can use this technology if we use it intentionally for, say, bereavement therapy or for grief support. But as a minister, I have some grave concerns, pun intended. <laughs> I wonder. What happens if this stuff causes harm? What about people who are vulnerable or grieving who can't tell the difference between an AI hallucination and a real memory? And then there's all of those legal considerations. Who owns this thing? Who can change it? Who can delete it? Who can create it in the first place? But for all of these very real ethical considerations, what I want to focus on today is that it is not about what these grief bots can do. It's about how we use them. I shared my own story of loss tonight to highlight how important it is that we share our stories of grief with one another and that we confront grief in our lives and not hide from it. I do not think that we should use grief bots to hide from those questions that we so desperately want to ask of that open-mouthed abyss. The where did you go? The what did you see? The what have you become? Instead, we should use the technology, whatever tools that we have at our disposal, to lean into those questions more fully, more openly, more honestly, more lovingly, more fearlessly. And so I'm going to leave you with another set of questions which may or may not make you uncomfortable. How might you use the technology in your life, including AI, to get closer to your humanity? And how might you use the technology, the tools, the AI at your disposal to make peace with whatever abyss that you might be staring into right now, whether it's death or otherwise. Thank you.